on-site consumption, cannabis events, and cannabis tourism. We're gonna start off discussing on-site consumption, and Amanda's gonna give us kind of like an overview of the different approaches in different jurisdictions across California. Yeah, absolutely. And we also first want to start by explaining, in California, there's on-site consumption and there's events. These are two different things, and we're going to talk about on-site consumption, and then there's two variations of on-site consumption. Um, so you've got places that are dispensaries that uh, have a consumption venue attached there too. And then there's such a thing that's separate. Those are standalone lounges that are places just to go consume cannabis. And those are the two different concepts we're looking at. So San Francisco is one of the earliest. Uh, what San Francisco has is three dispensaries that have on-site consumption lounges attached to them. Now, these were in existence well before uh, all the state regulations came into play. And San Francisco wanted to do more work and look at this more carefully down the line, but they decided to grandfather in those three. So those are the only three in San Francisco today that are allowed to have these. That said, San Francisco is looking at a much more robust set of regulations for that right now. Uh, they are very concerned about uh, clean air and, and worker protection in that environment. So we're going to expect some probably really robust regulation there in the coming months. And uh, they're probably going to set the stage for, for many more. Now, in Coachella, Cathedral City, and Palm Springs, they also are on-site consumption uh, and it's been a pretty recent uh, developments in those places down in uh, the, the valley. Sure. West Hollywood is yeah. interesting. They have both. They're looking at lounges and they're looking at um, places that have on-site consumption and they're different licenses. Um, and, and that's interesting because it's a combo play. But the thing about West Hollywood is they've always kind of looked at themselves as, you know, adult Disneyland. And they're like, yeah, bring it on. You want condom billboards? Cool. You, you want uh, strip clubs? Cool. They're open to everything down there. And they're like, this, you know, this fits West Hollywood. It's adult Disneyland. So uh, they've been very uh, aggressive about that. But they're still working on actually issuing permits. So they haven't issued any of these on-site consumptions um, or separate lounge licenses yet. But I'm going to pass the mic to these two ladies if they want to add some insight, because I think they've both worked on applications in West Hollywood. Yeah, the interesting part for me about West Hollywood is they, they are more willing as a city, I think, to push the envelope uh, versus what the state will allow. Um, they also look specifically at edible consumption and the <laughs> desire to have restaurants and ready-made food. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Also, the idea of smoking and having the ability to do so at a consumption lounge, that ties into OSHA and how, if you're not a manager, can you be in a facility and exposed to smoke and your workers exposed to smoke? Um, how that consumption lounge, they, I think at one point, West Hollywood was discussing staying open until 2 a.m. for a consumption lounge. Um, what is that going to do to the dynamics and how do you have to be a good actor within that facility? So we're gonna see West Hollywood continue to push the envelope, um, work with the state to fold in where they need to be. My favorite comment during the WeHo process was when they said, we have no children. Uh, when discussing <laughs> setbacks, the city manager was like, don't worry, we don't have children. Um, my <laughs> godson goes to school in West Hollywood, so that was interesting. But if that <laughs> gives you any indication about where that city is, those are cities that I think are gonna come on with events, as we'll talk about later. But if you were to ask me a crystal ball question, I don't think they're the first one that's going to do an event outside of their existing would-be allowance for on-site consumption and retail. And so one of the things Pam was just talking about was OSHA, right? You heard her talk about OSHA. The concerns that San Francisco raised and the reason why they're getting robust are actually the same things that were raised in a recent report from Cal OSHA. So Cal OSHA was first uh, tasked with looking at whether or not they needed to create regulations specific for the cannabis industry. And so they created a, a work group internally on this and they put out a report, I believe September, I don't know, 30, uh, sometime in September. 
And what this report did is it looked at a lot of risks, you know, to workers in the cannabis space. You know, it, it looked at things like people working in cultivation facilities and protection from pesticide exposure and this and that. And most everything they came up with, they said, well, that already is covered. Like farm workers have rules that they need to follow in general in any agriculture, and those would apply and protect the workers here. But one of the big things they got hung up on was this on-site social consumption and uh, exposure to secondhand smoke. And so that's the same thing that San Francisco is worried about and that we're probably likely to see more on Cal OSHA from. Um, and how does that come in with like the clean air laws, et cetera. So definitely keep an eye on Cal OSHA. That's, it's the uh, industrial uh, relations uh, board basically is what it's properly called. So before we really go down the road of telling you where it's where things are evolving, how things work, you know, what towns are starting to um, see some progress in this direction. I would just tell all of you in the audience that you really have to just adopt this mindset that this is a starting point, and really the way you get things going is to start having conversations with the people in the municipalities where you want to work you have a much better chance of developing a program that really works in your real life situation than to sit back and wait for them to come up with the ideas. Come to the table with a business plan. Let them know what you're thinking about doing. Let them know that you're well capitalized. Let them know about your ties to the community. It's all of those conversations that will give them the comfort level to take the next step. And there will be many municipalities that will wait for other cities to do it first, and they'll wait to see how things happen before they do something. But you can start having those conversations now. And it's better to be armed with information that helps educate them. You should not assume that they know as much as you do about the cannabis industry. You're really taking on um, the responsibility of educating the people that you meet with. So one thing to add to that too is Diane is so right. It's it's not just that you can. It's you know people in our in our software right. You could see every city council meeting, and so there'll be an informational item on Prop 64. And I tell people those don't just happen. It's because a stakeholder went to that city and pushed them to have that conversation. And if you're not the stakeholder that's initiating that conversation, another one is, and you're not a part of that conversation. These conversations are all happening because somebody is doing it. It is rarely the city going, huh, wait, I need to do that. So remember, if you're not, someone else is. And it's, we at Greenwise like to call it a solutions-driven approach, right? Have the conversation and know what that city does in same or similar circumstances that you want to do. If you're talking about consumption, if you're talking about an event, they have rhetoric already built in to their zoning code. They have processes in place. Permits, and so if you make it comfortable, if you make it comfortable and familiar, you're going to get more traction in that conversation. And let this be a good steward of the industry. If a city is toying with the ideas to whether or not they want to regulate, showing them an educational event that's well organized that they're going to get an ROI on that may push them into regulation. So this is really a way or a mechanism that we've been gifted to be able to have an honest communication with the local jurisdictions where they can see the activity before they have to go and develop an entire program for the supply chain of cannabis. This gives them a flavor of that, and so hopefully we can use it to spark more regulation throughout the state. Thank you for that. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about um, use in homes, so I guess a lot of questions from people who wanna think, you know, what are the uh, boundaries and parameters for sales and consumption in private residences, and how is that different than what we're talking about. Can you quickly go over that? We can you can together. consume cannabis in your private residence. That's, you know, rule one. You cannot sell to your friends unless you are a licensed business and your friends are at your licensed business. Um, 
you can give to your friends, you can consume with your friends in your, in, in your own home. If you are in your backyard, you got to be a little careful sometimes because uh, where is that in regard to what's public? You know, are you visible to your neighbors? Are you visible to the street? Be a good neighbor. They're probably not going to come after you. No, I always like to asterisk that if you're living in an apartment building, look at your lease and what you're allowed to do um, or your commercial business and you want to throw in a vet. We are still unfortunately a Schedule One federally illegal substance. It is very commonplace to see in a lease that you shouldn't be conducting commercial or you shouldn't be conducting federally illegal activity. That is, it seems logical, right? You wouldn't want your business being used for a crack house. But in California, right, it's true. But in California, we have a call out for cannabis. It's something when we work on cannabis leases within the supply chain verticals that you have to address. So what does that mean? That means we need, as Diana will talk about, more places for responsible consumption. So what we're seeing in Colorado, which kind of is a little bit of a view into the future of this, um, I just attended an event a few weeks ago. And uh, the person that has been holding these events, they are private events. They are held uh, usually on farms um, that are close to um, the more metropolitan area, but their people are fine with having consumption on their private residences. But she has gone methodically through every step of the process to make sure that even the businesses that she's working with, the dispensary, the brands that she's working with for these events, are following all the regulations along the way. So for example, in Boulder, where I live, Boulder has created an, another layer on top of the state regulations that requires that you can't sell product below what your wholesale prices is. So she has had to go through the effort of putting together goodie bags with the brands that are sponsoring these events. Um, they have to work up a price structure. They have to ensure that the total quantity of the goodie bag items don't go over the state limits of what an individual can purchase. And then those peop then the people that are attending these events actually have to go to the dispensary to purchase the goodie bag, and then they bring that goodie bag with them to the event. So my recommendation to all of you is, you know, find out all along the supply chain, if you're wanting to put it on, a, on an event, find out what, you know, the dispensaries are going to have to do to stay in compliance find out what the event's going to have to do to, to remain in compliance. Um, there might be uh, little nuances that you have to use when you're sending out your invitations. They might have to be um, vetted for making sure that the person's 21 or over. There's all these little details that add on to what you're going to have to research to make sure that what you're doing covers all of the check boxes, you know, that nothing gets left unchecked. So it's, you know, as um, we have learned from experience, complete compliance with the local regulations and local directives is critical to make these events successful. California is so individualized. There's 58 counties, 482 different cities. They're each going to have their own way of regulating cannabis events. And so now we're going to dis uh, start discussing uh, cannabis events and... Um, I guess we'll start off with Assembly Bill 2020, which is a major legislative development, and I'll pass it off to um, Pam, who's the lawyer. AB 2020 allows for events to not solely take place on fairgrounds or district agricultural associations. This has been an extremely limiting aspect of uh, cannabis event regulation because the DAAs, whereas you would think if you were limited to a county fairground or a district agricultural association that that state agency would have control over their borders um, or what happens within those jurisdictions. They do not. So you had to go um, to the local jurisdiction in which 
a DAA or a county fairground sat and get their approval. That doesn't necessarily seem difficult, but in the instances in Southern California specifically, you had the 28th DAA who wanted to throw um, the chalice event. They had to go to the city of Victorville. The city of Victorville had banned all cannabis. So while you had a willing district agricultural association, in that instance, you didn't have a willing jurisdiction. So with AB 2020, you opens up to other venues. So let's say a neighboring city of Hesperia, who now currently has delivery allowances, wanted to throw an event. They now could identify um, a location within that city. The event organizer could come in and ask for local approval, and it doesn't need to be on the fairground that is located over in Victorville. So it opens us up to being able to have events. Um, not at DAAs or county fairgrounds. What does that mean? And how do local jurisdictions grapple with that? They're going to have to have some amount of a process. And what is that going to look like? We're gonna see a significant uptick in regulation in this area. And as we've discussed, if you go to them in a solutions-driven way and say, how do I go about doing this? How do we work through it together? Do you have an existing temporary events or an event structure that we can just add cannabis to as an additional element and we would go through and you can get your state um, event licensee and that shows that you've already committed that you're already understanding the cannabis process and will make that conversation easier. So before you go to get your event license or your temporary event allowance from the local authorization, get your events organizer licensee to show credibility, proof of concept, that you understand the cannabis rules and the discussion that you want to have. Yes. I guess to elaborate on the process, the step number one is to get a cannabis event organizer license from the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Yes. And right now they're handing out temporary cannabis event organizer licenses um, until the permanent regs are released. Um, and they're handing those out for free. Um, step two is obtain local authorization, express local approval from the local jurisdiction. Step number three is get a temporary cannabis event license for an, a temporary cannabis event lasting up to four days at that location. So this allows for short-term events. Four days is pretty generous. That's like a, a three-day weekend. And so um, it, it really unlocks cannabis events that we have seen so far six in the state of California. They have all been at county fairgrounds. Now we will start seeing cannabis events, all sorts of places. So I would like to hear from the panel panelists, what kind of cannabis events do you want to see that you haven't seen before? Because like California has almost like a, you know, blank canvas when it comes to cannabis events. I mean, I've seen like bacon and beer. So like cannabis and beer, I mean, cannabis and bacon event sounds kind of fun. <laughs> the Munchie Festival, who knows? But I mean, some cool pairing events would be pretty fun. Okay, next. Ah, cannabis events. Um, I like to see an event where we showcase responsible consumption and change that oh. image where we're really interacting together, having an experience, being able to understand what that's like um, and, and invite novice people in and do an event that's really about microdosing and what does that mean? I'd like to see that. Ooh. Pam, that's, all right, now she's got my brain going. I would love to do, I'm changing mine. I want to um, do an event for, for like baby boomers where over a couple days they could actually try a bunch of different products in a controlled environment where they felt safe and learned because a lot of people go wow. buy something and that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to, see, and this, then they're like over and they'll go back to their pharmacy, but I would love to see a multi-day event where, you know, every few hours they could try a little bit of this and that and figure out what heals them. Like a, and, and make it like really, you know, geriatric friendly. Like a cannabis wellness weekend. Yes. Right? Lovely. This is what something, collaborative something that, uh, is like. Something that us OGs could go to, right, Amanda? Um. <laughs> getaway, spa getaway. I mean, I think something that's really interesting is California is the size of other countries, you know, world economies. It's a, it's its own, you know, giant ecosystem. And we're already comfortable with how much tourism uh, happens in California. We have 
Um, I have some data here. Uh, 23.6 million tourists come to wineries. So just apply the same principles to cannabis. I, th I think it'd be great to be able to go out to a farm and see the cannabis growing and then maybe follow them uh, to the manufacturing location where that's turned into other products and you know, then you get your goodie bag when you leave maybe and, um, and maybe you even are, are able to sample some cannabis while you're there. But there, you know, there's gonna be so many people coming from other countries for the experience, pl places like China and uh, South Korea, where um, they are not going to legalize anytime soon, and they want to come here to experience that. And um, there are so many great events that are already being done. Like, um, have you been to any of those uh, those businesses that offer like you bring some wine and then you can paint a picture and things like well. Oh, Puff Puff, puff Paint. Yeah, so, yeah, we have that in Oakland, Puff yeah, Puff Paint. Yeah, so um, a, a friend of mine started her business <laughs> called Puff Pass and Paint. And they also have Puff Pass and Pamper, where they make bath salts that are infused and things like that. And um, all those great ideas are, are coming here to California as well. I have a client waiting on a license in West Hollywood. They've teamed up with a chef, a 420 chef. And they're working with labs to figure out how can we have him demonstrate making some infused food products to his audience, quickly go have that tested once it's become infused, and then get the test results back in time for these people to actually consume on site. Wouldn't that be cool, right? I mean, we'll see things like that evolving as time goes on and as people take the leap to uh, not only be the first, but to kind of weather the storm and work out all the kinks of those things. We're, we're California. We're coming back with a resurgence of an events culture. I think it's, it's really going to be interesting. Cannabis is notorious and has a legacy for creativity and innovation. And I'm excited to see what's to come. I'd like a cannabis demo weekend, all right? Like putting everyone's ideas together. And, and see what that's like. I'm, I'm excited for what 2019 has to offer, personally. Very much so. Um, so, you know, I guess we already have a very thriving ecosystem of cannabis events in California. What does this mean for all the pop-up events that we're seeing? How are they going to adapt? And Got to have, uh, I think this is where you talk about track and trace, right? Um, Pop-up events have been very concerning, uh, specifically to me. When we talk again about in private residences, what do you do? If you have a vendor that's showcasing there in California, how does that product get to that event? It cannot come from a manufacturer to your private residence for them to give that product away and consume on site. It has to go through the proper channels, which here in California means it goes to a distributor. That distributor undertakes um, QA, QC procedures. It goes to a third-party lab. It's tested. It's cleared. It has a cleared COA. And then it goes to a retailer. A retailer sells it. Um, and whether or not that's an event license that you can get uh, to sell at that private residence, because you are not a dispensary in your house. Um, as Amanda said. So these sort of pop-up events that have been occurring that are either on private property, and again, I always go back to what's in the lease, are you jeopardizing somebody's building by doing so? Or I heard from the audience, what about uh, liquor licenses? If you're having it at a restaurant and you just did a pop-up event, what is the liquor, what is the ABC gonna say about that? Do you have to not sell? alcohol. If you're doing a cannabis consumption event, we've seen the governor, Omar, remind me of the bill number if you have it off the top of your head, uh, is that signed the bill that you can't have alcohol and cannabis, which was then teed up in the draft permanent regulations that we saw, where you can't confuse a consumer and have de-alkalized beer or wine with cannabis in it. There's a lot of concerns where those you just two can't collide. call it wine. Don't call it wine or confuse the consumer. So if it's in a wine bottle, I think there's gonna make those arguments 
uh, that it may not survive. So we're still going to see what that looks like and tread very cautiously anytime you're going to have an event. And I think the, the plaguing legacy of pop-up events is they are constantly combined with alcohol consumption. Yes. And the Bureau of Cannabis Control, the uh, chief, Lori Ajax, is the former deputy chief yeah. of ABC. And so she has a very strong regulatory enforcement background in alcohol enforcement. And it seems pretty clear that both agencies want there to be a clear, bright line of division. Their concern, in my view, is the naive consumer, people crossfading, who are not experienced in using both cannabis and alcohol. Uh, they basically want to avoid the horror stories of somebody who gets completely wasted because they're using both substances. And they find that's a way to mitigate the public risk. Should we go into some law? Now we're going to get down to events in California cities, and we're going to get some of the very latest updates on cannabis event ordinances from um, Amanda Osteritz. Yeah, absolutely. So what's interesting is I actually made some phone calls because I wanted to talk to some cities uh, because there wasn't as much. San Francisco was using our platform recently, and they, they called me and they said, hey, all I found was this, that, and that. Am I using the software wrong? I said, no, it just AB 2020 hadn't been signed yet, and people weren't dealing with it. And so there wasn't a lot. But now Oakland is one who they just did a cleanup. Um, I believe it was October 2nd they passed this new ordinance. And what it did uh, was it referenced their pre-existing event laws. They just said, here are our laws for events. And that's what are going to be the laws for events for cannabis. But we're going to limit you to 12 a year because we don't want you using this events license as a workaround to actually having a dispensary. Uh, they didn't want people to basically just have a new event permit for each day, the next day, the next day, and, and, and be playing their system. San Francisco is working on something more robust. Uh, expect to see more. Um, and within with the last couple of weeks, let's see, we saw Eureka just recently pass some ordinances around events. Um, I talked to uh, Humboldt County because I thought, you know, that's a great place for events. And basically, he said, our ordinance basically just says follow the state rules and get approval from us. So basically, the exact process Omar outlined. So some cities, I think we're going to see a trend of a bunch that are just going to say, here are our regular event rules, follow the state's cannabis event rules, and then something's going to get messed up. Someone's going to, you know, do something stupid, and then the locals are going to start making some more rules around it. But if you guys act responsibly and, and uh, you know, don't push them to where they have to. We'll probably stick with less lenient laws. Um, I talked to Joe, who's sitting back there. It sounds like this is something they're going to take up next year in Sacramento. Yeah, take a deeper look in next year. They got enough on their plate. But give it up for Joe being really like progressive and getting a lot of law done there. <laughs> I like making him blush. Amanda, can you elaborate a little bit on Sacramento's uh, unique event ordinance, which I think could be a model for the rest of the state? It just delegates the authority to approve events to the city manager, is my understanding. Oh, well, that was an administrative rule, basically. I think it, to make it was the goal to make it so you don't have to have a hearing at a city council meeting every time, much the way that if you were going to do a normal permit for certain things in a city, you go and you submit, and the person in the city manager's office can approve or deny it. And basically what they're doing is making less uh, city council hearing type of situation and, and delegating that authority uh, to make it smoother and simpler. And I think streamlining that approval process can really um, allow more events to happen in California. So I, I, think, I think we're going to see more of this, but I think initially we're just going to see people saying, hey, you have to get your permit from us. State law already says that. And then look at their events laws. And again, this is one where if you want to influence your city to allow these events, go and look at their event laws as they are and show them how to incorporate that by reference. They might not know how. It's really simple work. But if you hand them the draft that just says, hey, you've got these. If there's two, three things you want to add that are specific to cannabis, you know, that's simple enough. Here's how Oakland did it. Here's how someone else did it. Show them the cities that they generally look to when making policy that have examples of how it's been done. They never want to be the first. Unless, you know, you're one of the big renegades like, you know, Oakland, West Hollywood, Sacramento, San Francisco, who are setting the stage. So looking at the crystal ball, Pam, where do you think in Southern California we will see uh, these temporary cannabis events, not at a fairground or district agricultural association? I 
think you're gonna, they're going to be in more unexpected places. I wouldn't say that come January you're going to see an event in Los Angeles, Santa Monica, or West Hollywood. I think you're more likely to see it transpire potentially somewhere like Malibu or more likely in Coachella or Palm Springs or Desert Hot Springs where they're used to doing events, where they've already taken proactive steps towards consumption, um, and they're not inundated like the city of LA with processing the supply chain. So I think if you look outside of those, you're gonna see some interesting heavy hitters come in and set up the events rhetoric here in Southern California. And I would encourage you to go, like I said before, to smaller cities um, or even Long Beach and ask them to engage in that conversation and provide, as, as Amanda said, that pathway. If you take the guesswork out of it and you provide a potential avenue and solution, you can get to a point to throw um, a well-conceived and please root it in education and compliance at first and then I think you're going to start to see those barriers come down and like a snowball will have more of a robust events culture. And, and one thing to add what Pam is saying, it's not just bring it to them, you're going to see a, a lot of, uh, I think, or what I think is going to be a successful approach are people who have an event and are looking for a location and, and they're going to go to cities that need money and they're going to tell them this story and say, look, we have, you have all these hotels and you have an average vacancy rate of what percentage? Here is the economic stimulus we can bring to your city over the course of a two-day period. And they are going to present what does it look like on the number of people that are eating in the restaurants, the hotels, etc. And if you find a city that is looking for revenue, they are going to hear this story and they are going to like it. Like, I mean, let's look at San Francisco. Do you think they enjoy doing outside lands? No, but they make a ton of money for the businesses and they stimulate the economy in such a way during those events like Dreamforce and Oracle World, even though it puts a strap, you know, it, it's, it's painful. But you talk money and what it's going to do for job creation and revenue. And that it's going to go away after two days. So this is a good way to endeavor into potentially regulating more. If a city's a no city, that doesn't mean it isn't one that you should approach. Because this is a way to show them how this might look and what it can do in a, in a controlled environment that's a short duration. And strategic partnerships. If there is some other event that is taking place, if there are businesses, like Amanda says, or hotels that are going to come and support you and say, this is a strategic alliance. We are coming together. We are business owners in your city, and we want to do this. That is what's going to get you over the threshold or cross over that line is these are other business owners that are constantly giving ROI to the city and that they already trust and vet your strategic partners. Um, but these should be businesses that the cities already have a trusted relationship with and they'll help usher in and steward that conversation and give you an overarching sense of credibility. Diane, any thoughts? Well, the other thing that I wanted to add, I guess, to what's already been said is that, in, again, in Colorado, uh, we have a, a significant amount of tourism as well, and it's gone up, uh, they, it's gone up incrementally since legalization happened there. And so when you're talking to these local municipalities, let them know that tourism by itself might increase between 2 and 5 percent over the next few years, but if you incorporate cannabis tourism into that, it's more likely to go up to 15% like what we've seen in Colorado. So again, tying it back to revenue and job creations and communities, that's always a good starting point so they can see the benefits that will come of it. Perfect uh, transition to cannabis tourism. And so um, let's discuss what is cannabis tourism and um, maybe Diane, you can, or maybe who, who wants to field it? I mean, cannabis tourism can be a, a number of things. Uh, it can be signing up for a bus tour where you can consume on the bus and visit different dispensaries and um, maybe, um, you know, there's a musical event tied to the end of it, you know. Um, but it could be more specific, too. We mentioned the Puff Pass and Paint uh, events that were going on. 
Um, from my experience, when people are coming from a state that they don't have any kind of legalization, people want to see what it looks like in a dispensary, but they're very intimidated. How do you pick the right one? You know, they want to have a good experience. And so they rely on uh, other people to put together a whole package for them. So they don't, it takes the worry out of their hands. Of, am, am, I, am I picking the right place? Am I going to have a good time? Um, and it's all done for them. And, um, you know, and then you can tap into the other tourist events that are already happening and just make cannabis another part of it. Mm. And uh, let's talk about kind of uh, legal considerations for operators. And uh, I think there's a lot of contracts and also disclaimers that go into this. If you're going to bring cannabis in to another business, make sure that that business isn't jeopardized by the cannabis overlay. Um, I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier, ensuring that there's no provisions that would prevent this type of activity in a lease, dealing with the ABC, dealing with the liquor board, dealing with when you're bringing people into an event with cannabis, that they are responsible consumers, that you are not advancing any opinions that the dispensary may have, um, making sure that they are lawful. If you are bringing outsiders that don't know cannabis into a tourism situation, that you are vetting the operators that you are working with, making sure that they have an active and approved license, um, because you're a conduit for bringing people in. Uh, to these business situations. So the ABCs of good business transactions, they apply in this instance, especially if you are a cannabis tourism conduit where you don't specifically touch the plant. That's a really good point. There's a cannabis uh, tourism operator in Sonoma County who was recently sued and a temporary restraining order was imposed on that cannabis tourism operator because the tourism operator took uh, some tourists to an unlicensed cultivation site that got sued and uh, they looked at the Instagram photos of the tourism operator at the unlicensed cultivation site and they got roped into this litigation. So I think what you're saying oh. makes perfect sense. That was an excellent example. Thank you all. <laughs> now, um, Maybe, Amanda, you already talked about this earlier about cannabis events being magnets for cannabis tourism and the economic synergies that can result. Um, you know, can you elaborate on that or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're looking at this, uh, uh, you know, how do you get government comfortable, right? That's key to this. And there's a lot of places that are wait and see, but there's very few things that you can try on, right? You can't say I'm gonna uh, maybe experiment uh, with allowing cultivation and, and take it away because you're going to end up in a Calaveras County situation and nobody wants to, Calaveras to happen to them. So if a city would rather do something like this as a way to uh, test out what this might look like, feel like, what the people are that are going to show up, you know, that's a really good way for them to test this out. And it's it's so easy for them to feel the economic impact. I mean, it, it's quantifiable, they can see it, it's easy stuff. We're talking about sales tax revenue generated during that event in the city across all businesses. This is data they can quantify. And then you can also, when you're going to a city, you can bring that quantifiable data from other cities to show them what that had. Now, you also have to look at a place that makes sense. Like, don't go throw this in a city with no hotels unless you're looking to do a camping event that has camping grounds. Um, <laughs> you know, you want to do it in a place that has this need. So you don't want to also do it in a place that's super wealthy because they don't necessarily need that revenue and want it. Uh, you have to be mindful of the who, but they can see in a very short period what this can do. And, and then you tell them, okay, now imagine you could even put 1% sales tax on top of it specific to cannabis. You could start talking to them about reasonable tax rates because they're going to see it first without taxation. They're just going to see what general sales tax is generated there based on regular pricing, regular hotel pricing, all of this. And it's also a conduit to talk to them about a more responsible tax rate from the start. Because a lot of these cities got told these stories from some consulting firms not to be named who gave them very lofty ideas of what they could generate in taxes um, with a 5, 6, 7 percent 
rate. Well, when you combine that on top of regular sales tax, on top of state taxes, it's becoming prohibitively expensive. But by using something like this event as a conduit to just show what the economic stimulus can be on an economy, now we talk about, oh wait, now with an actual license and a business that's got their foot there, we're talking about new jobs, we're talking about ongoing revenues, we're talking about people that are gonna live there and shop at the grocery stores, not just eat at your restaurants for two days, and so on and so forth. So you can really use this as a conduit to make them understand the overall economic stimulus on a city, and then lean into that, uh, the next conversation that they're gonna say, but let's add some taxes too, and that will help you start a more reasonable taxation conversation. Thank you. Now let's discuss quickly uh, how operators can ensure that local governments have a positive experience so that they will incentivize these events. And we'll just start with Diane and work our way back here. Well, I would definitely invite them to the event that you're planning, <laughs> right? I mean, um, we know just in advocating that when you can make it personal, either by telling your own story or the story of someone that you know, people will buy into it much better. So invite them into your dispensaries, invite them to tour your facilities, let them know how um, responsible you are, that you've got these standard operating procedures, you've got tight security, um, you're following all these inventory control measures, um, but really making them comfortable with who you are and how you're running your business is the way to open the door. Have a plan. <laughs> Have a business plan. It sounds basic, but if you're going to go in and have a conversation, know the theme of your event. Know who's going to attend your event. As Amanda said, know what numbers you may be able to generate. Are you going to put people in restaurants? Are you going to put people in hotels? Are you gonna have strategic partnerships? And use this as an opportunity to change the perception. We are all cannabis ambassadors, we are all cannabis stewards, and if you set the bar for your event and say that you will not tolerate um, irresponsible consumption, that you will be uh, evicted from the event immediately upon those plans, have a plan for security. At every point that is a concern or that would be a concern for the city, go in armed with an answer. This is how we're going to deal with odor. The first event, maybe we don't allow flower smoking, right? Maybe we limit it. Does the city that you want to have an event in have an anti-smoking, no smoking ban, right? Know, the, know what questions you are likely to be asked and have the answers. Because the worst thing is to say, I have a solution, I have an event I want to do in your city, and then the first thing that the city manager or somebody you encounter asks is, well, what's your plan for security and what's your plan for odor? And there's crickets. That's not gonna get far. So if we're talking about how you have a culture of responsibility, how you change the cannabis stigma, these are the things that are gonna change it. More than the dispensaries, it's how you interact with the product that's gonna change the conversation and change the perception. And we've got such an amazing gift with 2020. The one thing that plagues the cannabis industry is one bad actor ruins it for everybody. And you say, I say it a lot, you can't, you can't have nice things if you don't respect them. This is a real nice gift. The best thing that we can do is respect it and demand that respect of your attendees. So from a more practical point of view too, like yes, don't be a jerk. Like that, that's, I know we have to say it a few times, it's shocking, but let's talk about the community, okay? Buy local. I don't care that the costs go down the street's gonna save you $2 a pound on your steak that you're gonna be serving. Buy it at the local grocery store. I don't care that the chairs cost 50 cents more from the local supply company. Buy from the local chair company your rentals. Put as much of the spending that can be done for preparing this event into the local economy. Moreover, 
If you are making a boon, make a charitable donation to the organizations, to the Little League. Like, not only are we gonna not let kids into this event, we're gonna make sure that this adult event benefited kids too by, by helping repair the baseball field. Figure out what the community cares about there and do your job in giving back. It will pay dividends. Who in the local jurisdiction approves cannabis events? Amanda? It depends. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the city can set that. They can delegate that how they choose. So in Sacramento, city manager, a lot of places it's going to be council. Second question. What kind of license or permit does one need to organize cannabis tours as an operator? Well, the tour itself isn't going to be a licensed activity. An event has to take place at a location. So the person that's operating a tour bus is going to need a tour bus license, um, not a cannabis license. Yeah. Can you have a delivery service delivered to an unlicensed cannabis event? <laughs> Here. We're get Unlicensed a whole bunch cannabis of events, events is the problem in that question. <laughs> yeah, the, the answer was already there, so that's a no. <laughs> that was a trick question, very well drafted. <laughs> Can you speak on what you know about preparing your own products to sell in an on-site consumption setting? How does this align with state testing requirements? That's a complicated question. and. I think the quick answer is, uh, you know, on-site consumption needs some sort of local approval for it to be legal. The state doesn't really rec uh, regulate on-site consumption. That's why we have some consumption lounges at the local level, and if they get a local permit, there's no corresponding state license for a consumption lounge. Yes, is there a workaround for AB 2020 not allowing alcohol sales and consumption on the premises of a temporary cannabis event? I think this is a good old legal answer of it depends, right? When you're, when you're working with the locality, if the locality is going to say we don't want alcohol where there is cannabis, they can put that condition if they're going to issue an event. I mean, first and foremost, you're going to want to separate those two uses out um, and not combine them. But we're going to see this as an evolution. And I personally would like to ask the ABC what their perspective on this is. They've been noticeably silent. We've seen OSHA step out in front of this. We haven't seen the ABC. So what are they going to look at with regard to their liquor licenses and their liquor licensees? I know specifically with hotels, they are concerned about this issue. Um, and they're going to have to go to their insurance. So I like to take it all the way back when we talked about contracts, too. Know what your insurance limits are, right? If you're entering into a contract and you're indemnifying the location that you're going to have this event so that you can get them on board, know what their insurance limitations are and what your insurance limitations are. Because if there's alcohol sales there and that invalidates either your insurance or the location's insurance, somebody consumes both alcohol and cannabis, and then that's the story that splashed across every headline in California and beyond, this is why you don't get nice things, right? So I think <laughs> we all come, it's funny, but we come back to that, and until you have trust between operators, localities, and the state, you may not be able to combine two psychoactively uh, enhancing activities, right? You may not be able to have alcohol where you have cannabis at the beginning. So I, that, you gotta be responsible, respectful, and earn some trust. We're a cannabis industry. We get a lot of flack from alcohol, beer, beverage, tobacco companies. So if we can focus in, earn that trust, and start to see what that looks like, you're going to have a more meaningful conversation. It may be hard to do both. And the workaround I've seen for some cannabis events is outside the premises of the yeah. cannabis event, there is a separate, um, I call it the A camp from the Rainbow Gathering days. It's the alcoholics camp on the outskirts of the Rainbow Gathering. And that's where the cannabis beer, or I'm sorry, that's where the alcoholic beverages yeah, get, yeah. Sold, get served. Jackie? Uh-oh. I 
I didn't they go. were not selling cannabis. Absolutely. So what they did was they had separate buses that were outside of the premises. And so people were not, the alcohol was being served inside the premises. It was a regular alcohol serving facility. But then people could leave their alcohol inside, leave the licensed premises and go get on a bus. And that bus was private property, non-public, dark windows, so you can't see out and they were able to consume there legally side by side, but without the two mixing. Alcohol had to stay inside. You know, and that is, mm, I mean, Why maybe if, if it was on blocks, and the reason for that is that um, California law prohibits smoking inside vehicles, and a bus is a vehicle. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> if it's on blocks and it's not mobile, it it's no longer a motor vehicle. Drop an anchor. Yeah. Private property would be a place where you are concealed from the public and we're not visible. And that is not a, a government land like a park or a school or the street. So this was a private parking lot inside of a vehicle that was not detectable from outside of it. Those are all the arguments I would be making in court. Right. The <laughs> point is, is you may get to court. Okay, so if it's a private residence, private property, and close to the public, then what's the situation? You can give your friends cannabis. Yeah, like, yeah. you can have, a, you can have a, a dinner party at your home. Just don't sell cannabis Just at don't it. Sell cannabis. That's called a dinner yeah. party. Giving away less than an ounce is legal for adults 21 and over. When you're selling to adults 21 and over, it's a misdemeanor. Selling to under 18 it could be a felony. But remember, if you're inviting a brand to sponsor and they bring cannabis to give away, that's a different scenario. How did that brand get the cannabis to your dinner party? Question back I, there, Kate. I It'll be our last one because they're giving us yeah. a hard stop, but one last question. There is. There is. There is. All right. Also, in Southern Humboldt, there is now a Southern Humboldt Visitors Bureau that is concentrated on doing gathering information and supporting cannabis events in Southern Humboldt. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. That's really important. Thank you so Thanks much everyone. for attending.